so without any further ado, uh, I have a wonderful privilege tonight to introduce uh, actually a very good friend of mine, Mike Amos. And Mike is the founder of Empathica, uh, which is a software company that grew to about 180 people, 100 brands, and operated in 50 countries. And he's always brought passion about creating new businesses, new disruption, and bringing software value to the market. If you're anyone who has either shopped at, at uh, Marshalls, at Winners, at HomeSense, the next time you get your receipt and you look at the bottom half of the receipt and you have the option to enter one of the customer surveys, notice that it is powered by Empathica. So you might not have realized it all these years, but Mike's company that he started, founded, and grew was number one, had the number one market position in Canada, the UK, and number three in the United States. So he cl clearly was a global leader in his company. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mike, let him inspire you. He's going to share, as the title of his presentation is 10 Lessons of the Startup World. And I know there are many people here tonight that are building and growing a company, so I would encourage you to really internalize this, see how it can apply to you. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Mike Amos. So I'm so glad to be here. Don's a great friend, and I, I certainly love working in the north. I spent a lot of years up here with Loblaw companies back in my early days in my um, career. Uh, and I certainly love working with new entrepreneurs and, and uh, hopefully sharing some genuine and, um, thoughts about my experience as an entrepreneur. I think in uh, history's um, view of entrepreneurship, when you hear stories about people who've been there and done that, you often hear the sanitized version. Like you hear. Uh, about all the things that went right, but you don't hear about the things that went wrong. And I think that's unfortunate because it gives you a very distorted view of reality. And I, I need to, to guarantee you that I made as many bad decisions as good decisions in my, my journey as an entrepreneur. Uh, and I'm hoping that maybe by telling you a story about my experience with Empathica and some lessons along the way that you'll make fewer bad decisions if you are in an entrepreneurial endeavor or if you choose to, to start one. So that's my, that's my hope for this presentation as an outcome. So as background then, uh, Empathica was founded in around 2002 uh, in Mississauga, Ontario. Beautiful Mississauga. Rooftops as far as the eye can see. Um, <clears throat> but it was convenient. My two business partners were, Mississauga was kind of in the triangular middle of our houses and so we decided that's the place to start the business. It was started to solve this problem with consumer data and retail and food service organizations. They didn't have a lot of insight into their customers because it was too expensive for them to get insight at the local level. It was hard to imagine like doing research in a particular Loblaw store or a particular restaurant because of the cost of gathering the information from consumers. But what they knew is that they usually won or lost market share at the local level. And uh, that was their challenge. We were disrupting a, a market. There was two separate markets that we were disrupting at the time. One was this thing called Mystery Shop, where they would pay someone to come in for around $50 and do a, this kind of mystery shop. They would experience it and write a report. And the other was market research and traditional market research technologies, which were often very paper-driven and very costly to do. Uh, we had a few enabling technologies. One was the internet. Have you, I'm sure you've all heard of that. Back in the uh, early 2000s, though, it was still a question with brands that we would talk to. Like, they say, well, will consumers go online? They'll see this thing on the bottom? Of, will they actually do this? And they will. It doesn't appear that many of you do it, but only about 2 to 5% of the people that saw that invitation did it. But when we sold the company, there was 80 million people a year in 26 languages doing that. Um, so it, it, it was a viable source of data, and it produced these huge samples of data. Uh, that combined with POS systems being more flexible, as you see there, and some other technology, we were able to cobble together a solution that was far more cost effective than the traditional solutions. And so the process was simple. Don introduced you to it. For you as a consumer, you might get invited by one of the many brands we served. In Canada, we were into um, Esso, uh, Swish LA, Montana, so all the care brands, uh, McDonald's, uh, S um, Petro Canada, HBC, Zellers. Mark's Work Warehouse, um, the list goes on and on. Um, and in other markets such as the US and the UK, we were in Starbucks glo Global uh, Worldwide, we were in McDonald's in the US, uh, Tesco in the UK, Boots PLC, a number of really great leading brands. Um, <clears throat> so you would go to these retail establishments, you'd get invited, and you might accept the offer to do a survey for a chance to win a prize. You'd answer 25 questions, and you'd press submit. And that's where it would end for you. And I would say that was the end of the beginning. Um, 
the beginning of the end was where we took the rest of the data and produced something valuable for these brands. And that was the tough part for us technologically. These were early days when we couldn't install software in people's PCs around the world. We had to use a browser. And we had to produce a verticalized BI tool so that people everywhere could download thousands of records of data and make sense of it and then improve their business. And they would follow this kind of virtuous cycle of data acquisition, report delivery, they'd identify some solutions, maybe their pricing was off, maybe their service was poor, and they would implement the solutions and hope to get better next time and certainly grow more market share. <clears throat> Our secret sauce, or one of the many things we did, we discovered early on that if you asked stupid questions, you got uh, data that wasn't very valuable for growing your business. <laughs> and uh, so we often tried really hard to make sure that we asked smart questions. Uh, the smartest way to ask these questions and to figure out what questions you should ask is to develop a statistical model of what drives loyalty in a business. And that's a high-end analytical technique that uh, needed to be uh, executed by a researcher of sorts. Most brands couldn't afford to do these high-end models of what drove loyalty. We decided to commoditize that a little bit and build the cost of it into a recurring revenue stream. So the brand could get the value of this big piece of uh, statistical work and pay for it over time, much the same way you would lease a car. Uh, and that was a really, dis really disruptive component to our value proposition. I had a team of about 12 to 15 MA and PhD level uh, statisticians on the team at the end who were doing nothing but these models, thousands a year for brands. But we, in that effort, could distill almost any retail or food service experience down to the 20 things that drove 90% of what drove uh, statistical, statistically drove loyalty. We could predict it, which was really amazing and uh, brands got access to this when they couldn't really typically afford or justify the expense. So as I mentioned, disruptive components. There was real-time data acquisition, uh, so speed to market, speed to insight. We had high professional services integrated into the, rev into the actual revenue model. Um, we were SaaS before SaaS was cool. In fact, it was called ASP back then. And uh, we weren't really geniuses at all. We weren't on the vanguard of anything. We were just trying to solve a problem, which was I can't install software on you know, every Tim Hortons franchisee's desktop and not lose my mind. Can we just get them to go online and see it in a different way? We charged them by uh, on a monthly basis, which is now in vogue as a service. But we did that just because the mystery shop budgets were set up that way. And uh, we did do some cool stuff around team mobilization features, as well as targeting different buyers. Well, <clears throat> this is interesting. There's people in organizations who you don't want to sell to. And they're usually the grumpiest people because they've, they've got the least money. And researchers are among that crowd of people. And if there's researchers in the room, I'm sorry. I, I, may, I may insult you several times this evening, but I really don't mean it. Um, but the, we, we sold directly to COOs and VPs of operations, people who had big budgets and lots of employees. And we sold them on the idea you can drive sales with our product. Even though there's a big research component to it, we broke down some organizational silos, and we, we found the money, and we went directly after it. So here's our story. It's gonna, you're going to laugh, cry. You may fall asleep, but uh, I'm sure it will be an interesting ride for you. I'm going to take you through. Uh, I guess 12 years and 11 lessons of my Empathica experience. And, and hopefully, uh, by the end, we'll, we'll all agree that it was valuable for you. Um, <clears throat> and so we found it in 02, roughly. Uh, the dark days of the post-9-11 era, the dot-com explosion or blow up, or what, I guess I shouldn't say 9-11 and explosion in the same sentence. I'm also sorry for that. The dot-com collapse, again, a bad, another bad word. So 9-11.com stoppage. Uh, a friend of mine was in a big dot-com company. We thought, hey, let's do this thing. It sounds really cool. We might be able to get something going. We talked to a bunch of angels in the US. No one was taking our pitch seriously. And no one had money. No one had a desire to invest in the startup. So we decided, OK, enough. We'll just build it on some, well, we built the software on PowerPoint, essentially. A bunch of, it was called Slideware. And we started trying to sell it to people. <clears throat> Which we did. We actually closed uh, the third meeting. We closed a deal with Famous Players Theaters for $400,000. So we were revenue positive before we had any product whatsoever, uh, which created a lot of fear because now we had two months to actually build this product that we promised them on slides that would work. And we didn't have a lot of money, but we leveraged our mortgages and stuff. And we started building the product. The big lesson from that era was uh, 
I have to sell holy, and you, you can fill the blanks in. I wasn't a salesperson. Um, I'd never been trained in sales. And when we were meeting with angels, they always asked us, okay, you, you want all this money from us. It looks interesting. What, what is your use of proceeds? That's the language that a lot of private equity people will want to ask and will use is, how will you use my money to grow the value of my investment? And the first thing I said, well, you know, we don't want to sell this. Like, we've got a great idea. How about we just, we're going, to, we're going to hire some killer salespeople and just go, and they would look at you like, you've got two heads. Like, you guys aren't really doing anything right now. Neither of you are programmers, and now you want to hire salespeople. Like, what will you be doing? And the one guy who's a good friend of mine still, and he did invest in the company ultimately, said, like, why don't you try selling this stuff first and see what happens? And that was my holy, you know what moment. I was like, I've got to learn how to sell, which I did. And in fact, I think I closed probably in excess of $50 million in total deal value over the time that I was there. It wasn't easy. I was terrified about selling but it was the best thing I could have ever done. And uh, so that led to the famous players deal, but it also gave us a, a potent weapon when we were building the company because we were always in the front line selling the product to uh, companies. We were hearing all their feedback all the time. Uh, we could change pricing, we could change features, we could change how we talked about it to become more relevant to that company that we were talking to. And over time, we just got better and better and better at selling, but we got better as a company for it because we were so close to the customer all the time. And I found as we grew and we hired like professional salespeople, they didn't have the same umbilical cord back to the rest of the organization. Like they, they would tell you like, it's too expensive, that's why they're not buying. It wouldn't be the real reason. They wouldn't really think too much about it, unfortunately. But when you're a founder and you're in the, the meeting and you're seeing them grimace and, uh, and, and other things, you, can, you learn a lot. I once had a meeting with one guy my a lead generator set it up for me, and I got there, and he's like, so what are we here to talk about? And I said, oh, I'm talking about customer satisfaction measurement. He's like, oh, God. He actually did. <laughs> and he hit the table and started to tell me about his daughter's uh, soccer or something. So, you know, I had various meetings uh, from good to bad. It informed everything that we were doing uh, as a business. And, um, and once you, in the early stages, get those war stories, it helps you sell more because you've got stories about other customers, and it helps you sell to investors, investors because you've got war stories for them as well. <clears throat> so O2 then, uh, as we progress through O2, um, you're thinking, my God, he's taking so long. We've only done the first year. No, not even done the first year, and it's been 10 minutes. I know, I know. You might start, can't wanna, you might want to cancel your meeting after this because it could, it could take a long time. Um, <clears throat> I call it Beachhead. I've named every, every year as best I could. I'm not much of a marketer, but the names get pretty exciting as we go on. So don't read ahead, please, Frank. I see you're reading ahead. Please don't do that. Um, beachhead. This is, we're into O2 now. We've got this one deal with famous players. We got four people above a diet shop. I gained an incredible amount of weight that year. Pretty ironic, isn't it? The diet shop is right downstairs, and I'm gaining weight. Uh, but some great things happened that year besides my weight gain. Um, <clears throat> we raised $250,000 in angel funds in June because we were worried that we didn't have enough money to make the famous players thing really work. Famous players loved us. They were huge advocates, but we didn't have a lot of money for technology. And then in September of that year, we closed a million dollar deal with Shoppers Drug Mart. <clears throat> so a year in now, we've got about five or 600,000 recurring, and we've got visibility to about 1.5 million over three years. So it was a good year. Um, but the biggest lesson I learned that year, aside from um, why diet shops don't work, is that um, these jokes are landing pretty good. <laughs> By the end of this, you're going to all be laughing. Um, <clears throat> is I did this deal with some angels, and I've got nothing but respect for angel investors. If it wasn't for them, most technologies would get nowhere. Um, but it taught me something about investors in general. Um, <clears throat> So imagine someone says to you, you want to play shinny on the weekend? You say, sure, and they say, you're going to be playing against Wayne Gretzky. Now, Wayne Gretzky's a bit old now. He's a bit older than me. But it, I guarantee you, he's still a better hockey player than you are. Uh, professional investors, angel, VC, private equity, they are like Wayne Gretzky's, right? They've done one thing all their life, potentially, and they're really, really good at it. And don't imagine, no matter how good you think you are at everything, that you'll ever be as good as them. And, and in knowing that, you need to also know then that sometimes they're so good at negotiating, they'll negotiate something for themselves, and you might not even realize they've slipped past you with the puck and they're going to score a goal. 
with my angels. Um, <clears throat> they were great guys, they're still good friends, but it, business was business. And we did a deal that ultimately came back to, to uh, bite me in a few years, which we'll find about just three years hence in my story. But I, I implore you, when doing a deal, don't just look at the valuation that your investors give you. We got like a $4 million valuation. We thought it was great, awesome, let's do it. But there's some terms in that deal that came back to haunt me. And there's lots of terms in any of these deals that you need to be aware of. Uh, Anti-dilution, so what happens if you raise money at or below the recent pre-money valuation that you agreed to with them? You keep them whole, typically. Liquidity preference, if it's participating, it can get super ugly. One example. Liquidity preference means they get to take a certain amount of their money out first. If it's participating, even if they're, you're seriously in the money, they take that money out first. So let's imagine it's a $100 million valuation on an exit. They put 10 million bucks in, they get a two times liquidity preference, which would be a hor horrible situation, but let's imagine it happened. You sell the company for 100 million, they got 10% of it, they take 20 million off the top, plus their 10% of the remaining 80, they got 28 million. They get 30% of, of the gains from that sale with having only 10% of the equity. These types of things are tricky. This is how you kind of get, someone can stick handle around you and get past you pretty quickly. So you need to, you need to be aware of all the various ways that you're transacting with, with people as you get into business. Because as an entrepreneur, you're just excited about the future. You want some money and you want to grow and you want to go fast. Um, inflection point, <clears throat> Canadian inflection point. Not as good as the American style, but it's still pretty awesome. It's Canadian inflection points are still pretty good. That was 03, so we just done this big deal with Shoppers Drug Mart, and we were like, yeah, every eight seconds, someone fills out a survey or something. And then we really hit the gas hard that year. Uh, without a whole lot of extra money, we, I, think, I think I booked probably three or four million dollars in sales that year. Um, and we ended up with almost every major brand either interested and or on the program. Tim Hortons, Petro Canada, all the Cara restaurants, SO, HBC, the list kind of goes on and on. Um, but the, the real lesson from that year as we started to grow sales really rapidly is that your initial customers, my first two initial ones, famous players and Shoppers Drug Mart, were critical to me hitting my stride in 03 and growing revenue from a quarter of a million dollars to almost two million in 03 and with bookings well in excess of that. Um, if, you, if you're in a new space and you're a new company and you're a small company, you need people to stand up for you and say, you gotta use these people. You gotta have customers that will do that. They, they'll do it for you with investors and they'll do it for you with other potential prospects and customers. And ours were brilliant. Um, famous players helped us at every turn and so did Shoppers Drug Mart and we were able then to turn that into millions of dollars of revenue. In other markets that we entered directly like the US and the UK, I can always point back to, if you look in, in um, orange there, I can always point back to one single beachhead customer, whether it's McDonald's Canada or Mitchell's and Butler's that led us to all these other great deals like literally millions and millions of dollars in revenue because one company decided to believe in us and they liked us enough to go on a limb for us and help us get future deals. So overinvest in your initial customers. The most important asset you probably have is one of the big lessons there. The other lesson is um, they won't do this for people they don't like. Like you've gotta, you gotta be genuine. You've gotta actually, they've gotta like you and they gotta believe that you're in it for them, not just for yourself. Um, another rule I had for my team was get on their side of the table as quickly as you possibly can. So typically when you're selling, they're here and you're here. What I mean is you've got to be there to help them. You're not there to sell them something. They've got to believe that you're there to help them. And you know, there was times when I was competing against a low cost alternative and we'd even say, listen, if you decide not to go with us, we understand, but please just let us see what you've designed before you implement so we can make sure you're not making any crazy horrible errors. And that kind of relationship goes a long way and it builds a lot of trust. Uh, and then ultimately be clear in your expectations of each other. Um, it's easy when you're in a startup to promise the moon and not deliver and that's a really dangerous path to go down. Always under promise over deliver as far as I'm concerned. <clears throat> so. Uh, oh, see, I skipped a year in here. See, it's 05, but lesson four. Uh, it's a little trick that we use in the business. Uh, you, you may never understand, but it's, it is a trick. Um, it's called chart a new course. 05 was a really sleepy year. So we'd maxed out Canada. I, 04 was a sleepy year. We'd maxed out Canada, kind of. So we went to 3 million. We went 250,000 to 1.8 million to 3.6 uh, in 04. Um, but then things started to slow down quite a bit because we'd 
we had maxed out uh, the Canadian marketplace for the most part, and we didn't have a lot of money to enter new markets. We had a foosball table, and we had NHL PA on PlayStation 2, I think. Anyways, I got really good at foosball and NHL PA that year. I didn't sell a lot, though. It was a really comfortable, nice year, but we weren't really getting much done. Um, 05, things started to really happen for a number of reasons, and it probably wasn't our own doing. I told you about um, investors and how they might put interesting language into deals at the start and how you've got to watch out for that. Well, my angels, God bless them, many of them, all of them are still my friends, had this thing called a put option in my angel raise. Do you know what, who knows what a put option is? And so if I own equity in a business, I can put it back to you, you can, and you can, I force you to buy the equity back from me. <clears throat> So they had this put option, and they were allowed to put back their 250 US to us uh, at three times in three years. So we enter 05, and I've got like a $4 million company with a $1 million hangover. And they're all threatening to put it back. You know, someone wants to redo their kitchen or something. Pretty great return, right? 3x return in three years is a pretty great return. Um, not only do I have that, but I've got a system now that's kind of falling apart. We were. Um, sell it, build it kind of people, because we didn't have a lot of money. So we'd sell a feature, and we'd sell some functionality, and that would prove that there was a potential market, then we'd come back and build it. And uh, <clears throat> I was always like that. When I was eight, I did this deal with my uncle, my uncle Peter. Um, and he was tearing down an old porch he had on the front of his house. I lived in a small town. All my family lived around me. So I was crafty, and I saw this happening. You know, it's the summertime, I've got some time on my hands, I've got some buddies I can get involved. And I said, you know, Uncle Peter, um, you're tearing out all this wood, right? He's like, yeah, there's a big pile of it in his front lawn. I said, you know, we'll, um, we wouldn't mind that wood to build a, a fort in the backyard or a treehouse or something. We'll take that away if you don't charge us for it. It's all rotten, crappy old, and P Uncle Peter's like, hell yeah, go kid. So we, we carted it all back and we built this, what was a pretty decent treehouse. Um, but then, you know, the kind of scavenging continued. Every time we'd find a new piece of something, like a stop sign or something, we'd tack it on. It started to grow and morph into something that was kind of beautiful when we had lots of resources in the plant, into this ugly, leaking thing that my parents ultimately just tore down and I think burnt in a big burn pile. That's what happened to our first version of our software. We'd run out, sell something, come back. We wouldn't really validate with anything, anybody else. We'd build it. And this thing was this big heap of technical debt that we had. So I have these investors now saying, give us a million bucks. I've got a product that needs to be completely rebuilt. OK, that's V2. That's the V2. That was our crafty name for it. I've now got to crank down the operations and make 15% in EBITDA, which we did, so I can at least um, save the company from our investors who were coming looking for a million bucks. And uh, OK, so I figure maybe now's the time to get some VCs involved. I can hold the investors off and say, listen, I'm going to raise some VC. You can sell into that round, you can make even more money, just you know, don't exercise your put yet. Um, and that seemed like a fair thing to do, and they were pretty happy about that. And then I thought, well, hey, why not just add, why not make this the worst year of your life? Let's enter the UK with no money, and Japan. Makes perfect sense. <laughs> it makes per because we, had, we were already changing program to program, like with the two M's and the E. How much harder would Japanese be? It makes perfect sense. So, McDonald's in Canada had this in for us in Japan with a channel partner. Uh, investors are yelling at us. Developers are working all night long. And we decided to end those two markets. Pretty brilliant stuff. Really, lots of good lessons here, people. You need to be, I'm, no one's taking notes. I'm really surprised, but <laughs> that's OK. My big lesson from that year is progress doesn't feel good. See, 04 felt good. I'm playing foosball, getting home at 5.30 every night. You know, my kids know my name, Dad. It's a pretty easy name to remember. <laughs> um, but 05, it was a really bad year. <clears throat> the kids started calling me mom. It was just a bad year. I was constantly in presentations. I, I think I could have almost had a nervous breakdown at one point because there was just so much going on. Um, but the thing about 05 was, as you'll see as my story continues, um, it was one of the best years for the business. It was a transformative year. Uh, I don't think growth ever feels good. And we're making really big, tough decisions, and you're doing what you should do for the long term. It's going to feel hard. Um, and that's what that year was for us. And the only thing I could suggest is if things aren't really working the way you want them to, you've got to give yourself the chance to take 
you know, look up above the trench line or step back from the forest and try to understand what the real causes of your problems are and then be bold and make a plan to solve the root cause of the issue and not just solve the symptoms, which is what we did. So 06, we've been out in market now and pitching to VCs and it, 06 was a cool year. We, we raised seven million bucks. Uh, our investors were able to sell into a secondary component of the raise. They got a nine times return in three years, so they were pretty happy. You know, I'm a bit of a hero now. Just wait, wait three months and get nine times instead of three times. Um, and we had lots of money in the bank and we were able to kind of step on the gas and really hit the U.S. hard. Uh, Japan, we, we, um, I did a couple trips over there and realized it wasn't nearly as much fun as it seemed. Um, and we, we just kind of focused on the U.S. and the U.K. as our two new expansion markets and let Japan do whatever it was going to do with our channel partner. So um, <clears throat> the big lesson from that year was, um, you know, in the, the capital raise pr process, early in we had a Canadian uh, VC who will go unnamed who tried to convince us that, you know, don't need to talk to anybody. We're your friends here. We're all friends. We're all, we're all good old-fashioned Canadians together in the room. Let's just do a deal now. We'll give you some terms. It'll be good. You know, save you all that time of talking to other potential investors. What could be better? Wrong. It's so wrong. It's so, so wrong. Don't ever fall for that. Like, I'm not saying people are inherently evil. I'm just saying it's guaranteed you'll get worse terms and if, you, if you don't have another deal on the table. So we call that baking the process. You really want to shepherd, if you're going to do a raise, shepherd everybody in a direction where you've got a few term sheets at once and you can understand what the market is for your business and you can start to negotiate effectively with people. No one's ever going to give you a good deal if they know that there's no one else there out there to give you a deal. So you've got to make sure you've got that in your back pocket. So that's what we did. In late 05, we did three cities, all Northeast Coast, uh, Boston, Washington, New York. 16 meetings, we had eight term sheets, four really good term sheets, and I had two deals. Now, that does sound strange. Why would you have two deals? Well, that's an interesting part of the story. The first VC was in New York, and uh, we went with them. And, <clears throat> and so we started to kind of celebrate. This thing's done. We're in diligence. We haven't lied at all during the, you know, all the initial stages. So the diligence will clear, and we've got all this money coming in, and everybody's happy and what have you around the office. We started to meet with these guys back and forth in the diligence process, and we really didn't like them, and I know they didn't like us. Um, I don't know what it was, I, but we, we just weren't clicking. And there wasn't five years of this. Like, we couldn't have withstood five years of us not liking each other, so the thing fell apart. We didn't want to do it, and they didn't want to do it. And I already told all the other VCs they were out. Um, so I had to then go back to the number two company, which turned out to be GMI Equity, which is rather massive now. They got almost $3 billion in funds under management. and. Uh, and say, you guys still want to be in? Because we've blown up this other deal. Thinking that they're going to extract a pound of flesh from me, you know, aha, you know, I'm your only choice now. Uh, frankly, uh, th uh, thankfully, they didn't. Uh, they were um, amazing partners. And they, they stayed true to those colors throughout our relationship, which was really amazing. They just, they, they gave us the same deal we talked about. It was a great deal. And we were able to get that done. But in all these situations, even when I sold the business, I was still a lot, our, that deal almost blew up 15 minutes before the wire transfers happened, before they paid us and we got the deal closed. Nothing's over till it's over, folks. Um, and be careful that you don't celebrate too soon or spend the money too soon. And the other lesson from all that was take a secondary component to uh, any raise you may do. If you're lucky enough to have them give you to buy, if you're lucky enough to have them buy shares off you as well as put money into the business, you might as well take some of your your gains off the table, which we were able to do with our angels so that you could uh, participate in the way up and not be fully levered into the business. <clears throat> okay, so this is where the exciting titles start. You know, and you can read ahead if you really want to, but 07, I call that Tidal Wave. Isn't that an awesome, that's an awesome title. I think we, all, we can all agree on that. You know, tidal Wave, ah, run, it's coming to get you, get off the beach, that kind of stuff. Uh, 07 was a great year for us. We had all this money and we were, we were killing it. We were inking million dollar deals left, right and center in the UK, the US, Citibank in the US, Brinker Restaurants, Food Lion, Canada. We still maintained our number one position. We had boots in the UK come on for about a million bucks. Like, things were really starting to happen for us. Big deals, lots of fanfare um, in that year. It was a, a really good growth year. We doubled our staff. I think we were up to 89 or maybe 100 people. Um, <clears throat> 
but I think it was a, a terrible year. It felt good, but it was an irresponsible year. Our, our business wasn't able to kind of withstand that kind of growth and the level of capitalization we were at. We were growing so quickly and hiring people so fast that we were, um, we had a bit of a leaky bucket syndrome. We weren't doing things as well as we could have, and we were forsaking future growth and our reputation as a business. And it's all because we didn't quite raise enough money. Most of the VCs we talked to wanted to put 10 to $12 million into the business, and we said, no, we just want five, because we're that good. Like, we can just do it on five, we're that good. Well, we weren't that good. We needed the, the extra five. Because if we had the extra five, we would have built some scalability features into our platform, we would have done the right things with our people, we would have had a VP of HR almost immediately, which we didn't, we didn't for at least another, we, we never actually did have a VP of HR, we should have had one. We, should have, we would have put those things in place that would have enabled us to do things quickly and well, uh, which we didn't do. And I believe that we would have, if I had taken 50% more money at that first raise, I would have doubled the enterprise value of the business when we sold because we wouldn't have had this leaky bucket thing going on with our revenue. Because growth really is how much you sell versus how much you lose. And then there was this other thing I came across. We had lots of people get sprinkling pixie dust in the business all the time, now that we have outside board members. Does anyone know what an alchemist is? Okay, I call this valuation alchemy. alchemy because when you've got board members from different, uh, that, that see different companies and think a lot about growth, uh, software companies and growth, they all have their little kind of pet peeves or rules of thumb. And they want to sprinkle pixie dust on you and hope that they can change what is your company into gold. Um, <clears throat> I wouldn't fall for any of it. You've got to build a sustainable business that can generate profits over the long term the right way. You know your business model and they'll, they'll tell you all sorts of of rules of thumb, like your cost of uh, customer acquisition has to be less than one times revenue, et cetera. But really, uh, all these things are probably correlated with success, but if you start to listen to them and just chase those um, particular measures, you might miss the boat on growing what is a really solid company. Um, the other thing to think about is when you are killing it from their perspective on their metrics and they love you, which in 07, uh, all of our investors were in love with us and they were buying common shares up off of, off of everyone they could you should probably capitalize on it and take as much money as you can at that point in time because it doesn't stay great forever. Like stuff happens, like recessions happen. Don't imagine that they won't. So capitalize on hot streaks if you can. And then for us, it was another uh, thing I learned that year and I, I put three lessons into this one lesson which I know is um, kind of sneaky, but I signed up for 150% revenue growth after we, we um, got the venture capital uh, with my board all excited about what we could do and I thought money was the only obstacle to growth and it wasn't. Um, we actually grew 90% um, and we, we got into two new geographies in a, make, a real significant way but it was still a failure. I, I still didn't hit my targets and I couldn't pay people bonus because I didn't control the comp committee. I was one of three members of the comp committee and I had to go kind of hat in hand and beg for bonus money uh, so I could at least recognize my people for what was a killer year. So uh, my lesson there is have two plans. Have the reasonable plan you can hit for your board, one that gets them excited but isn't overstretching, and have the stretch plan for your team, build it into their objectives, build the BHAGs into their objectives so everyone gets excited by the, the big, hairy, audacious goal, but it doesn't impair your ability to do what's right for the team. <clears throat> so drive message was the next major phase of our business. It, I call it the Drive message nautical disaster. I don't know where I came up with that in the hotel today. It, it was nothing nautical about drive message, but nautical disaster sounds pretty scary, right? And um, when we were raising money with the VCs, it, there's lots, so many smart people in that world, and they see so many deals. And the big thing back then was email marketing and CRM systems and one-to-one -one marketing. And so, first couple meetings, like they they look at our product and go, wow, you got all these email addresses of people who are entering surveys. Imagine if you could use it to sell stuff to people. Like, you know, this could be like an email marketing engine. Now, it wasn't part of our use of proceeds, but I'm no dummy. I'm, sometimes I'm smart, not just lucky. I said, fine, third meeting, it's right in there, use of proceeds. CRM, email marketing upside, you know, tell them what they want to hear. And they liked hearing it. So that planted the seeds with our investors and with us, frankly, to, to, for this drive message product that we built. And so we convinced the board, everyone got excited, we knew, we knew the sales pitch, we knew how much money was out there potentially. We spent a million five in building drive message, we had a team in the Ukraine writing code, we had a corresponding team in, in, in Mississauga working on it, we had this 
$300,000 launch campaign where we, we went to 11 cities in North America and the UK and, and really promoted Drive Message, which was an email marketing platform kind of bolted onto our system. And we were so full of ourselves that we thought, hell, we don't need to take equity anymore. We're so good, we're never gonna have any problems. We can sign up for four million bucks in venture debt. Why not? We still got lots of money, but let's take it now while we can. Venture debt with this thing called covenants. I'm not sure if you know about those, but those aren't very much fun. They're, they're kind of like put options, but the debt version of put options. Um, so what happened? Drive message, a huge fanfare. 11 cities, hundreds of people were introduced to this product. Many of them are our customers. We had 100, uh, a distinct, we had 100 actual sales calls as well on top of that. Just driving the team, get in front of people. Uh, we didn't sell one license, like not one. It was, it was horrifying. It was horrifying, yeah. And we had to kind of basically walk away from it. Um, <clears throat> and so I learned a big lesson in all of that. And I can tell you why it didn't sell in a second, but I learned the lesson originally back in the uh, late 90s. I used to work for Loblaws, and I did all these deals with this really high-paid lawyer named Bob Kitchen. Bob was old enough that I could respect what he had to say, but young enough that I thought he was still kind of cool. And uh, so Bob was like my age back when I was 30. So he's like 15, 18 years older than me. Love the guy, and I still do. I've, I haven't talked to him for years. But we would fly around together to get these deals done, and he'd be getting paid like 600 bucks an hour or something. So the one trip, I was like, this is BS. Bob's like sitting on a plane with me, flipping through the globe. I'm sure he's billing for this. I'm gonna make him earn this hour. So I, I just started to ask him questions. And he's duty bound, like he's my, I'm his, his customer, he's gotta answer my questions. I asked him everything I could think of with respect to his field of expertise in an hour. At the end I thought I gotta sum this up somehow. So I, I asked him, I said, Bob, um, what is the biggest lesson you've learned so far in your kind of 50 short years? And he said, never get too full of yourself. And he said it with a bit of a grin. And I think it had a double meaning, like the, the first meaning was, you know, hubris is bad, being too confident can create blind spots. And the second meeting was, shut up you, because <laughs> you're really starting to bother me. The flight back, somehow the airline or Bob had magically changed his seat to be like two rows up from me, <laughs> and he was back to his paper and he was quite happy. But I was too full of myself. We were killing, we were doing million dollar deals in a bunch of different countries. We'd done it on very little capital. We didn't validate drive message at all. My, my first core product, I went out to customers every stage of the way. I was selling, always thinking, always wondering, always asking questions, changing things, building that ugly tree house that eventually was rebuilt to be a really great product. Um, and this one, we just said, no, it's gonna work. You know, we're golden, and we put the money down, and it didn't work. It didn't work because the email databases were still too small. Retailers and food service organizations rely on mass marketing more than they do one-to-one uh, -one marketing, and that's why it didn't work. Um, 09, so do you remember the recession? Anybody, was anyone alive for that? <laughs> A lot of young people in the room? That completely sucked. So we're coming out of 08, right? And I got $4 million of debt with these things called covenants. The covenants have got a revenue and a cash flow component. I got to hit targets so I've breached my debt and they can come and ask for their money back or do unspoken ugly things to us um, with a, a venture debt firm called Oryx out of the uh, West Coast. Um, so there we go, and uh, the fall of 08 is upon us, and the banks are collapsing, the world's kind of on fire, and you know, sitting around with my management team, and they're saying, why are you so anxious? I'm like, well guys, it's simple math. And I remember it in the whiteboard, I'm like, okay, so we've got these covenants, remember? Here's what needs to happen. We need to lose $3 million in revenue, and sales need to be flat for a quarter, and we've breached. Okay. Um, then we get some news. National Citibank, million dollar customer, being bought by PNC, everything's on hold, that contract's going away in a few months. Quiznos, you know, you heard about them, they're the toasty people. Wasn't so toasty back then for Quiznos, they were gonna go bankrupt. There's a million two gone. Food Lion, not as courageous as I thought they would be. They had to cut the program too, and the spend, and we're gonna force us into litigation if we force them to pay it out, that's another million. At the same time, Sequoia, one of the most kind of storied VCs in the West Coast, issues this memo or this shot heard around the world, which was basically to their portfolio companies, burn the furniture, don't spend a penny, you may never see venture capital for another 18 months or more, and your customers might not be there either. 
So we're officially freaked out. And our year started November 1st, and this was late November, mid-November, and all you know, what's breaking loose on us. Um, <clears throat> And then I had the wonderful job then of downsizing in early December. You know what the worst day, like month to downsize in is? It's December, at least in North America it is. But we had no choice because we saw the covenant breach coming, we saw the revenue going down, and we had to start to save money somehow. So we fired 18% of our people, um, you know, and, and we, we did what we had to do. That first quarter ended January 31st of 09, and something crazy happened. Uh, the Canadian dollar devalued significantly over the, a few months in there. And most of my revenue was UK and US based, um, which was huge upside for us. We generated three quarters of a million bucks in cash in one quarter. Um, went from cash burn to huge cash, po cash positive position. A bunch of deals we had in the fire in the UK came home and we closed another $2.5 million in deals that quarter. And so I go from the world's on fire to best quarter in company history by the numbers. The attrition hadn't hit yet. And at the end of every quarter, I had this habit of standing up with the management team, telling the whole team about everything that happened, all the financials, it was a completely open book. And now we got to tell everybody that, um, yeah, we fired all those friends of yours and we had a killer quarter. It was a horribly mixed message, but it had nothing to do with what the decisions we were making. It was just weird macroeconomic stuff, unfortunately. So in that year then, uh, that year continued to be an amazing year. We, we booked $9 million in recurring deals. I mean, we killed, we closed some monster deals all over our target countries. Uh, we breached our covenants, yay, or boo, whatever. But for Oryx, because we were doing so well in that first quarter, we were the, we were the best of all their bad debt. And this is insanity. Not only did they kind of forgive us, they made us pay the uh, small penalty on our interest rate but they offered us another $2 million in debt. So they pumped four up to six. We agreed to pay like 30 basis points more interest and we we're still going. Um, and in our um, darkest moments, wondering how Drive Message could have gone wrong, so horribly wrong, because a million five went out the door to a product that never went anywhere. It should have gone into the core product, all that sales effort. We realized this email thing, that the email database still wasn't big enough, even though it was we had more emails for Shoppers Drug Mart than they had themselves from their loyalty program. It still wasn't big enough. Um, one of us had this crazy idea, and I, uh, I'm not sure which one it was, but it was like, hold on, there's this Facebook thing going on that you know, some people were into, and people have an average like 100 or 200 friends. What if, we, what if we got the one email address and then got them to promote it to their 200 friends? What would that mean? And that turned into a patented product called Go Recommend which in the years to come became this leading advocacy product for retailers and food service organizations. We'd find people who were satisfied in the experience and they'd promote it on Facebook, Yelp, TripAdvisor, and what have you. And we got a patent on it too, which was really cool. So even from the worst things, good things can happen if you think long and hard about your, about your, uh, about your failures. It's an experiment ultimately, isn't it? <clears throat> and then, so what I've learned primarily over the years and reflecting on those is timing is everything. Like, just because you're on a, an upswing like we were in 07 doesn't mean that the world's going to get, uh, isn't going to get worse. Like recessions happen. So take money when you can. And always remember, at least with, with large um, average ticket sizes, uh, large deal sizes and complex sales, the, um, the sales cycle may be six or nine months long. And if you feel particularly comfortable or happy one year, you're probably going to have poor sales the next and vice versa. My board didn't understand that. They would congr congratulate me in years when I really wasn't doing all I could. And other years when we were doing everything we could to grow sales the following year, we were getting uh, zero accolades. And uh, uh, lesson number 10, it's called Team Reboot. Um, not one of my best titles. Roller Coaster is one of the better ones, I think. But Team Reboot's pretty good still. I, I was hiring a guy in 05 to join the team. He was a horrible employee, ultimately. People hated this guy. but. <clears throat> He didn't last long, three months. That happens too in startups when you don't take as much time as you should to hire people. But you know, I, I was trained in how to uh, interview people. We had a competency model. We did all the things correctly that we thought were correct. And in interviews, sometimes you kind of wander a bit, you know? Um, and ours wandered into ball hockey of all things. Now ball hockey had no applicability to our business. But this guy had achieved some, like, an Ontario championship in ball hockey. 
hats off to you, man. How'd you do that? What was the hardest part, I asked him. He's like, well, I was saying goodbye to my friends. I'm thinking, what, you mean you go off to a tournament and you're going to miss the people back home? He's like, no, no, Mike, we had to cut, we had to cut friends from the team. Like, we get to a new level and those guys weren't going to make it. Like, we wanted to win the championship. We had to bring better players on. We had to recruit better players and cut the guys who weren't going to make it. And I found that happened to me over the years. I, I, and it was, the, it was gut wrenching and horrible to, to bring new people in above friends, colleagues, people you've been in business with for six, seven, eight years, but they just weren't scaling to the new challenge. And at that point, at uh, 14, 16 million dollars in revenue, whatever it was, like the challenge was completely different than at five million. Like you had to have people who could build systems and process and understood policy and had understood how to move many people in one direction in a repeatable fashion so that you could consistently produce a result versus the roll your sleeves up and get it done entrepreneurship that you see in the early stages of businesses. And so it was like new CFO, new CTO. Um, they're both doing great things now. Simon, my uh, ex-CTO, is the CTO of Air Miles and Loyalty One and uh, a new ops guy uh, and a whole bunch of new people joined the business um, to help us get to the next level. And what I saw with the CTO was interesting. Um, and I'll take you back to another story. And this is a, it's my way of making it kind of friendly and personal. Um, my dad was a typical baby boomer dad, okay? He didn't really, sp in, parents in the 70s thought like if, if you weren't injured, then it's okay. Like I'm doing a good job as a parent. As long as your kid doesn't get injured, you're doing a, a, a top job as a parent. So I was kind of starved for attention from my dad. And every time I got a, t a chance to do a project with him, I wanted so badly to impress him that I'd get super nervous and do things fast. And I'd end up screwing something up. You know, I'd be like, with a saw like this, you know, and then fly off and cut, cut myself or something. Um, and my dad used to say, if you want to get a job done fast, work slow. And I, I, I never really understood it until I saw what Simon did with our technology team. Because he joins the business with all this fanfare. He's a big shot at Cognos, and he's, he, he's British. You know, he sounds really smart because he's British. And he's <laughs> wandering around the office talking to people. He bought, brought some special type of tea into the office because the tea that we had was just no good. Um, <clears throat> but like months go by, I'm like, man, like, what are you doing? Like, let's get something going here. Roll up your sleeves. Get, let's get dirty. But really, he was trying to figure out where the big levers were in our technology operation. And he figured out that the process that we used to develop waterfall, drive message, disa nautical disaster, remember that one, was wrong. Uh, and the talent profile of the people we were hiring was probably wrong. We were hiring people for experience, not for capacity and capability. And so he started to rebuild things. You know, he worked slow. But once he got through most of these things, we started to really move fast including having just graphic designers wandering around arguing about colors of fonts and size of fonts on you know, the user interface so that we had this really pleasing product. Um, and it all started to take shape the next year or so later. Uh, we, we were winning awards for our product design at that point. And we, uh, this, this year is called S-Bucks or Starbucks. We, uh, we closed the largest deal in our space on the planet that year and deployed to every Starbucks in the world um, in 26 languages in probably 40 countries. Uh, it's a two and a half million dollar deal per annum. And it was, a, it was a great victory. And go recommend like, the product that actually came out of the ashes of Drive Message, you know, the nautical disaster that we talked about. I keep on reminding you of that. Was the, the crown jewel in that deal when we pitched it. We pitched them on something other than satisfaction. We said, your job isn't to engender satisfaction in your customer base. Your job is to create advocates in every location. And Go Recommend is your, your tool for that and can measure it. So it was a huge deal for us. <clears throat> the big lesson that year wasn't from the Starbucks win. That was really awesome, and we loved it, because it's you know, one of the best brands in the world for this kind of stuff, uh, was that we mismanaged some analysts. Um, and I won't name the analysts that we mismanaged, but. In software, there's this thing called analysts that I didn't know about. I just thought, I, I really didn't know. I was too busy selling stuff and to, to really think long and hard about the analyst community. But analysts are interesting. Um, you, so you, you go out and you want to build a new software company in a new space. You want to create a whole new software space. You, you find a problem, you figure out how to solve it, and no one's ever solved it this way before. Good for you, man. Um, so you start selling, and you start to get some success. And then a few competitors pop up, and you're all doing the same thing. You get to like $50 million in revenue combined. And then the analysts arrived at the party. And it's like, hey, and we're here. And then they start talking to everybody. 
and le learning about the thing you created. And then, and this is the, the uh, there's a point when they purport that they know more about what you created than you do. It's like your kid's teacher is saying, I know your kid better than you do, but they actually get away with it. And once they reach that point, then they get to tell your customers and prospects how much more they know about the space than you do. And these are people that probably did a creative writing degree at NYU, and now they know more about this software space than you do, which wouldn't be so bad. They could educate the community on you know, the prospects on who to buy and why to buy. But then they also do something that's truly evil. They start to rank all of you against each other versus each other. So like this is a beauty pageant now. OK? OK, so they, they're going to start to rank you and put you in some kind of quadrant map or some hypercycle or something. Got it? OK. And your buyers are now going to use what they say, because apparently they know more than you do, to buy in the future. So in the year when we did like, the biggest deal on the planet, the most coveted deal on the planet, at least in retail, uh, the analysts showed up. And they say something to you. They say, we're going to rank people in the space. We're going to create our magic quadrant or our hypercycle. You want to participate? You say, no, not really. We're not really a fan of beauty pageants. And they're like, well, you know, if you don't show up with your evening gown and you know, your, your baton, we're going to tell people how pretty you are anyway. So don't you think you want to come out and give it your best try? So you do. But what you don't know is the judges of the beauty pageant are also coaching some of the contestants. Isn't that crazy? That could never happen in a beauty pageant. You can't be her coach and then like be voting for this lovely lady over here. Obviously, you're a man, but uh, this lovely lady here. I should see. I've been working on pointing at the right gender. It's still not quite there, but um, that's what happens. So the smarter companies and smarter than us, they start spending half a million bucks a year with these analysts to kind of get insight and teach us all these things that you know that I don't know, but apparently I taught you it eight months ago, but now you're going to teach me again and teach me about market positioning, et cetera. So, you know, we thought we were the best in the world, but we came middle of the pack in that report. And then our competitors started to use it against us, which really sucked. So the only thing I can use to describe my feelings at that time is, is if you were to imagine one million consecutive swear words just in your mind, please don't share them. But that's kind of the process I went through to kind of reconcile all of it in my head. So if you've got, an an, if you've got a, a software company, you've got analysts, please learn how to manage them and do it early. <clears throat> uh, OK. So 12 hits. And uh, sorry, I'm jumping ahead here. All the stuff we've done to rebuild the team starts to really hit home really nicely. And we decide, you know, we're tired. It's time to try to get out. Uh, when you do a deal with v VCs, you know the, the ultimate outcome is going to be some kind of liquidity event. You're going to have to sell the business. You don't have the choice of turning it into a lifestyle company unless you're going to go out and find someone to lend you $100 million, which isn't going to happen. Um, but we had some great things happening in our tech team. We did social scraping, which is like Radiant 6 kind of stuff, bringing in uh, data from qualitative data from all over the web about brands, integrating it with our quantitative data. We had some really cool things happening with Go Recommend. We'd expand it to multiple platforms like TripAdvisor, et cetera. We hired an investment bank uh, from the West Coast, and we made sure the operations were solid. And one of my best friends from childhood, who ended up being a, a rock star operations guy with Amex, came in to, to really help sure that, ensure that that was the case. And we got to like zero attrition in our client base or customer base, which was great. Ultimately, that story ends with us getting a few offers to purchase the business, and then we sold it. Went through a four-month period of diligence, which was frankly too long, but we sold the business in 2013. And and you find me here today. Um, <clears throat> it was a wonderful time in my life. If you're thinking about becoming an entrepreneur, I, I highly suggest you really consider it. I, I, I frankly could have done other jobs. I, had, I was a senior vice president at Brookfield when I was 30 years old. So before this gig, I could have continued being fairly comfortable. I made no money for two years when I, when I started this. Like I'm zero money. I think I made less than zero money because I was investing. Uh, so it wasn't for the money. Um, if you decide to do this, it won't be about the money, and it won't be about choosing to work on Wednesday afternoon or not. You, won't be work you will be working Wednesday afternoon. You'll be working Wednesday night. You will be working Saturday morning and Sunday afternoon. But you've got to do it because you love it. You, and you've got to love it. Whatever you're doing, you've got to love it intrinsically. The extrinsic stuff, the money will follow. You've got to love your team. Like, promise yourself you won't work with people you don't like. You don't have to in the early days. As you get bigger, you do. But in the early days, you don't have to. And you got to do it because you love the customers. And you love the idea that you're going to add value to their business and to their lives, whether it be 
uh, everyday people in a B2C application or what I was doing. Also know that everything takes twice as long and costs twice as much as you think it will. I do lots of like building projects. You can see the injuries all over my hands. I still do them. Uh, and my new, my new rule of thumb is if it takes me less than twice as long, it's been a successful day. Uh, so always understand that and take more money if it's available to you. And then uh, finally, my dad's uh, rule of move fast. If you want to move fast, you've got to work slow. It really does suggest uh, it really is important. Uh, as you're growing quickly, make sure you're investing in the right places so you can repeat the process and be scalable and not lose customers. Um, so that's my, that's my story, and uh, thank you for listening.